Rock and roll. <laughs> that was. Let's get going. No, but that was left on from my um, Chester Bennington poem. I just left it on there. Do you remember when I read Chester, he was rock and roll? Yeah. I see. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything. Oh, am I on yet? Okay. Hello, hello. Yeah, you can hear me then. Do I have to do? Do I have to bend way over, or I'm good? Should I pull it forward? Okay. So, welcome to the pen and pencil reading. This is our 22nd year as a uh, writers group, sponsored by the Kelly Writers House. And I want to thank the Kelly Writers House very much for their sponsorship. We meet here bi-monthly. And as you know, uh, they notice they always put out uh, food and drink for our reading. And in the back, we have a full crew recording, Autumn, Henry, Nick, and Zach. And another young woman who I didn't oh, Mary. and Mary. OK. So we have a full crew. And you'll notice we also have a kitchen crew. And they're playing a collection of rainy day jazz back there. So I, appreci <laughs> I really appreciate you coming out uh, despite the rain. So as I said, we've been a group for about 22 years. I was not the founding uh, member or one of the founding members. John Shea and Wendy Washburn are two founding members, and they're going to read tonight. And we are writers of all genres. And our niche is we're Penn staff and faculty, but primarily staff. So if you work at Penn, you can be in this group. And it's not strictly poetry. There is Supposed and Eyes, which is a poetry group. This is for novelists, short story writers, nonfiction writers, poets, uh, essayists, memoir writers, experimental fiction. Uh, we take it all, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, this past Wednesday, we were joined by well-known novelist Elizabeth Laban, who shared her journey from writer to published author, highlighting tips about agents, contracts, and encouraging us to never give up. It was a special night. And she is the author of nine, no or nine, I'm sorry, five novels, including The Restaurant Critic's Wife, The Tragedy Papers, and most recently, Beside Herself. And I was just online looking at her books, and they're great. And she's um, friends with Lisa Scottolini and uh, Jennifer Weiner, other published writers here in uh, Philadelphia. So please look her up. And so again, I just want to say thanks one more time. And we are going to get started. Wendy asked, why is the rock and roll still on the program? That came from two years ago when I did my Chester Bennington poem. And we had Lincoln Park in the background. So that's why it's still on there. It's an archived memento. So without further ado, we're going to start with Carol Cloud and some poetry. And we're just going to go around the order of the packages. Thank you. This is great. There's more, um, sorry, there, there are more people than the usual group. So thank you all for coming in such a weather uh, challenging environment. Thank you, Kelly Writers House. Thank you, Jerome, Helen, and John. <clears throat> I'm going to read four poems. Um, uh, I, I'm Carol Cloud, and I have uh, I, I got my MFA from UNC Greensboro. Um, and uh, at the time, I was uh, focusing on fiction. I've also done plays. 
Um, and for the past while, I've been doing poems because I was mentored by Fred Chapel, And I want to dedicate this reading to Fred. So <clears throat> my first poem is called If I Open My Window. If I open my window, would a flock of birds fly through? Would they be pigeons or gulls swirling and diving inside my room? Or simple brown sparrows full of twittering songs perching on my bed rail, my chairs, chirping their hearts out into this bright afternoon? Would they be parrots, green as emeralds, flying in circles, landing and lunging again? Would they be eagles, their wings wide, rising into the heavens of my room until, in rhythm with their cries, a pair would dive into the flowing waters of my floor, their claws pitched forward to catch the salmon, leaping upstream on their way to spawn and die, caught by such misfortune, gored by yellow beaks, just in time to feed their ravenous young. Um, this is another poem. Most of these poems my group has not yet heard. So there's one poem that uh, in this cluster that they have, but the rest are things that I've worked on for a number of years. And this is called When We Were Nothing. When we were nothing, we were beggars in the yards, and we laughed with yearning. When we were beggars, we still hoped for the regular things. Then we got lost in the forest of simple. We wandered for decades. And when we were lost like that, we gave up everything, even the ones we loved, because of the strong wind, the dense fog, and the sudden cold rains, because of the wandering horses, the gathering storms, the flocks of geese flying high into, darkening, into a darkening sky. It was then and only then that we saw hope as a folly, faith, a sun lost behind clouds, blackbirds singing so loudly we thought we heard our hearts break. Um, this poem is particularly meaningful for me. Uh, I wrote it when a friend of mine passed away. Uh, it, the title of the poem is Sacrum Facere, which means you are made sacred. You were not in those bright heavens where I thought I might find you after they led you quietly to your fall. I imagined you galloping through rain clouds, running wild like you did, tossing your large, willful head. Neither are you on this earth where I still seek you. Only empty fields stretch out into an early night, your paddock mates now shuffled to other quarters. Dust to dust, and me gasping like a fish ripped from the sea, while your shadow runs afire, tail high, and Winnie only a haunting echo now, a doomed and dusky song. The fields you grazed in without concern now stand empty, those pale ghosts of winter galloping hard in my chest. You, only you are now made sacred. As I run alongside, my hands barely able to reach your withers, still I grab a fist of your mane, toss myself up onto your wide gray back, and we rise high as you lift us into steely clouds, hooves sparking light throughout the sky, thunder rolling behind us farther and farther until the empty fields are quiet and the rains begin their endless morning, turning the earth to sullen mud. And my last poem is called, uh, My Heart is Full of Birds. My hands are full of air, air and bells, bells and wind. My hands are full of silver, bells and air, silver and wind. My arms are full of roses, like birds, they hover, float like stars, like roses. My heart is full of bells, silver and wind, pulsing into rivers and streams through this landscape of silver and wind, of birds, my hands so full of silver, so full of roses and stars that float like gold, like air, like birds. Thank you. So normally, 
I do actually print out my stories, but I'm having trouble with my printer, so it's not I'm not being ecological or anything. I just, in fact, I printed <laughs> out like 50 wasted pieces of paper. So anyway, so my story. I'm Wendy Washburn, by the way. <laughs> in case you didn't know. Anyway, um, the story is called Ideal Worlds, um, which it really isn't about anymore because. I only wrote it yesterday after I had given Llewellyn the title and I, I couldn't change it. So, <laughs> so it's. So you want to call it Ideal Worlds, maybe? <laughs> and um, yeah, so I have to apologize as I usually do every year <laughs> because I write these things at the last minute. I have a good excuse this time because I've been really busy. <laughs> All right. Growing up, I was never very happy with my life in the modern world. Maybe it was from being in a military family, moving around every year or two, never learning to create bonds with people or places. I was only really happy watching TV. And at the tender age of seven, I became addicted to visions of the far future through Star Trek and every other sci-fi show that my parents allowed me to stay up for. That phase lasted until my early teens when I started wishing I could live in almost any other time period but our own especially the 18th century, so that I could wear those glorious gowns and not be seen as a weird geek because I only listened to Baroque music when the rest of the world listened to rock and roll. <laughs> Mostly I wanted to go back in time, preferably the 20, before the 20th century, though of course only as a wealthy noble lady with plenty of servants. <laughs> I never considered for a moment that I would actually travel there, so I was happy reading novels from the past, Jane Austen of course, but also Samuel Richardson, Charles Dickens, Alexander Dumas, and the Brontes. Through these stories, I managed to enter an alternative reality, at least in my head. Modern fiction is full of stories of people actually crossing over into an alternative reality. In The Man in the High Castle, the most prominent example nowadays, the characters just need to meditate or something to reach a parallel world. They just poof from their own world and arrive in another drastically different one. If only it were actually that easy in our world, that doesn't work. I know because I've tried. <laughs> when I was 17, my dad and brothers and I stayed at a ski resort in the Cascade Mountains. While they took to the slopes, I preferred cross-country skiing by myself on a path through the neighboring forest in between reading, reading chapters of Lord of the Rings for the first time. By the end of the second volume, I had fallen hard for that story, gliding through the snowy silence, past mountain hemlock and subalpine fir with no hint of civilization for miles. I could pretend I was in Middle Earth. No, pretend isn't strong enough, more like really intense longing. I wasn't in Washington State at all, but skiing in the Misty Mountains. If I had had the resources, I could have bought a mountain, populated it with actors dressed up as hobbits and dwarves, dug out the mines of Moria, and built Elrond's house to live in. Of course, it would have been a fake Middle Earth, but on a purely physical level, it would also have been real. If I spent, say, years there, then had to return to life in Tacoma, Washington, it would feel like an unpleasant culture shock. In my case, the real world would be the unpleasant reality. But for others, Middle Earth would be a nightmare if, if they were transported there and forced to stay against their will. Though I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to live in Rivendell. But what if I forced people who preferred our asphalt cities and mundane working lives and had no clue what was great about the Lord of the Rings? to live there with the magic, the elves, the goblins, and wargs and Nazgul. They would doubtless do whatever they could to get out, whatever the cost. Eventually, I forgot about Middle Earth and made my peace with this reality for many years. But then, in 2016, all of us entered an alternate universe. <laughs> people, people with a lot of power and resources created it and pushed us into it. But it didn't start in 2016. Back in 2005, Carl Rove, George W. Bush's senior advisor, was interviewed by the journalist Ron Suskind for the New York Times. According to him, guys like Susk Suskind were in what is called the reality-based community, which Rove defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. Rove said, we're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously as you will, We'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. I remember reading that and being shocked that people had the hubris to believe that they could create a new reality. Back then, they didn't succeed altogether, but they laid a foundation for what was to come. 
I understand the mentality of those <clears throat> who, uh, who can't deal with the world they live in. They feel out of their time, wanting desperately to bring back the past, maybe the 40s and 50s, maybe even pre-Civil War America. They don't care that most people believe the past is over and settle for reading historical novels and watching fantasy TV like I did and do. Since they can't go back to a time when there, there was pollution and inequality and bigotry, these people with too much power and too little integrity have recreated these dark aspects of the past, succeeding in making a new United States by spreading lies and becoming experts at denial. Unable to change the truth, they have created a world where the truth is whatever they say it is. All my life, for all my trying, I never truly felt like I had entered an alternative reality. Finally, these days, I know what it's like, but it's not the one I wanted. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to read, uh, my name is Holman Massey, I'm going to read an excerpt from a science fiction novel I'm writing called The Peoples of Kanash. Um, and because it, uh, the section I'm going to read is about a third of the way through the novel, I'm going to give you a little background so that it doesn't make total nonsense. <laughs> uh, in this novel, human colonists have invaded a star system 19 light, light years from Earth, and they plan to colonize the planet Galena in that system, which has an established ecosystem of its own, with, to their knowledge, no intelligent inhabitants. The shuttle Aurora carrying the first five planetary explorers to the planet goes off course and crashes, and only one of the crew, exobiologist Carl Marson, survives. He's captured by primitive inhabitants of the planet who had not been detected by earlier remote surveys. These creatures have two arms and four legs. To them, humans seem to be missing the back half of their bodies, so humans are referred to as thupai, or halflings. Marson is able to communicate with the mothership Beagle in synchronous orbit above the planet, and he and the linguist Talia Adair and sociobiologist Eliana Rubin on Beagle hastily put together a language program to learn to communicate with the Galenans. While he awaits rescue, Marson undertakes a quixotic program of his own, frequently defying orders for mission control to educate the Galenans about the threat of human colonization while at the same time studying the planet's biology. And to convince them that humans are not gods, he teaches simple lessons in science to explain how humans do things that to them seem magical. One of these things involves smelting and forging of iron from ores around the camp, and this leads to a small industry of making points and blades for use in the Galenan village for trade. Um, am I speaking loud enough? Okay. Um, so, uh, trying to find find out from a guezo. The topic of reprodu reproduction had come up repeatedly in their language sessions and had been abandoned because, confu because of confusion and lack of common ground. But as their ability to communicate improved, it became clear that, the hum uh, to the, uh, clear that humans and Galenans Norms of uh, family structure and reproductive practices were dramatically different. The Galenans explained that they were born without gender as Ngoji, which Marson and his colleagues agreed to call nymphs. Ngoji grew through several, uh, seven or eight molts before metamorphosing into Ngamoji, which the humans called juveniles. And after several, several more molts, they metamorphosed into Ngojoji, adults or imagos. There were later non-reproductive stages the Galenians called by a variety of names, and humans half-jokingly grouped them under the umbrella of senior citizens. The Galenians were distressed and confused that humans did not progress from one gender to another in the normal course of their lives. Marson and Stone were men, Adair and Reuben were women, and always would be. It struck the Galenans that both human sexes missed out on a good half of what it meant to be human by spending a lifetime in only one gender. Privately, this added a new dimension to the aspersion thupa, or halfling, sometimes applied to Marson in the camp. The, the animal keeper Jejoji 
raised the competing theory that male and female humans were in fact two different species that somehow needed each other to reproduce. <laughs> when Jijoji privately brought this up with Marson, he laughed and said, it certainly seems that way sometimes. <laughs> Maybe you have a point. Unable to properly appreciate Marson's humor, the Galenian took this response as an affirmation and the idea gained some currency in the camp. Humans were two different species with kinky mating habits, not halflings, at least not in that sense. And perhaps Eliana Rubin was a hybrid after all. <laughs> so Galenian gender remained an open question to the humans. According to the Galenians, juveniles could, could receive a fluo from an adult, after which the fluo grew inside the juvenile until it was born a year and a half later as a first stage nymph. It was easy to surmise that the fluo was probably some kind of sperm packet that fertilized an egg in the ju juvenile, which then developed into a nymph. Despite the Galenian's insistence, the fluo was a living being which itself became the nymph. Thus, the gestation period was equivalent to human pre uh, pregnancy, and juveniles were female. Marson, taking the Galenian assertion that the fluo was a living being seriously, was not ready to jump to that conclusion and continued to call all Galenians it to make his point. He sincerely wished that he could find a way to investigate the Galenian life cycle more definitively to settle the issue. But just as, his, uh, as this discussion had run about as far as it could without uh, more hard data, Marson's prayers were answered when a new group of recruits came into the camp from the village to reinforce the mining and smelting operations. Marson had long been notorious in the camp for his habit of trying to run down and capture small creatures with a net so that he could dissect and study them. Machusho was quick to recognize one of the new recruits as someone who might have a lot in common with the human. Kateshi was a farmer from the village who was also notorious for showing an uncommon interest in all manner of living things. Kateshi, like Marston, was famous for capturing small creatures which he raised in cages, or which it raised in cages, in a way to remind them, uh, in a way that reminded them very much of Marson. When Kateshi showed up in the camp, Machucho and Jejoji looked at each other thinking the same thing. Carl Marson and Kateshi were made for each other. The two quickly drew the re new recruit aside and escorted it to Aurora's entrance, uh, entrance and rapped on the door. After answering the knock, Marson was introduced to Kateshi. With, when their common interests uh, were explained, Marson was delighted and tried to persuade the newcomer to join him as, an, as a biological assistant. Kateshi could not figure out exactly what Marson was asking, so to pique Kateshi's interest, Marson demonstrated the instruments that had momentarily captured the attention of the young ones and Machucho at the oasis. When the scanner was used to magnify some biological samples Marson had collected, Kateshi expressed an outpouring of enthusiasm that Marson, not quite accustomed to such a display, found almost terrifying. Having survived that, Marson quickly suggested that Kateshi be given a crash, crash course in conversational English along with reading and writing. The others, not expecting to move uh, things to move at quite such a pace, hemmed and hawed over how uh, this might be arranged without for conflicting with Kateshi's expected duties at the mining operation. But Marson was eager to begin training Kateshi, who he sum summarily deputized as his assistant and would not take no for an answer. The next few days, Marson secured Kateshi's release from many of its mining duties, began training it in biological te basic bi biological techniques. Even without the advantage of fluent ling linguistic exchange, he found Kateshi to be a quick study. And when Marson visited the breakfast lineup at the camp toward the end of, of uh, his mission day, things looked for t uh, took a fortuitous leap forward. Marson spotted a small, six-legged, lizard-like creature and vainly tried to catch it. The Gleanans were amused and asked why he wanted to catch the creature, which they called a guezo. Marson answered that he was interested in dissecting it. When asked why, he said he wanted to see how it reproduced. 
This led to another round of teasing about how the halflings didn't know how to reproduce properly, so they were trying to find out from Aguezo. In the midst of, the, of this teasing, Kateshi spoke up, dismissing the creature Marson had pointed out as impractical to work with, and suggested he capture another kind of creature called a Manesh that could be found in the Aurora, arroyos around the campsite. Marson tried to explain, relying on Jijoji's translation, that the Guezo was of interest because it shared basic features of body plan with the Gulinans. Jijoji had difficulty with this concept and stumbled over the translation, but Kateshi seemed to understand intuitively what Marson was getting at and gave assurances that the Maneshi also shared the anatomical features Marson was interested in. Impatient to pre prepare for an expedition to the nearest Arroyo the, final, the following day, Marson questioned Kateshi about what would be needed to catch her capture some of these creatures, and Kateshi suggested nets and cages and something to dig with, since these creatures lived in burrows, and Marson gladly agreed to provide them. So uh, my name is Llewellyn Fletcher, and we're going to do a little more politics, I guess. <laughs> but this is going back in time. Um, this is from a piece that I had workshopped with the group many years ago. I think the last time I read from it I was like 2013 or 2014. Um, but I was watching Meet the Press last weekend, and David Brooks, who you probably know as a, he said, um, what Jimmy Carter was when he got elected, when he beat Gerald Ford, was a moral cleanse. And that's what we need now, he said. And I thought, that's very interesting. Um, the Carters were friends with the Fords. They were, the Carters and the friends were close. The Carters and the Fords were close friends. Uh, Jimmy Carter and Jerry Ford had both been in the Navy, and then the wives got along. So that's different, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, um, so this is called Excerpts from Writing Jimmy Carter's Autobiography, and it's an unpublished sort of chapbook novel, chapbook um, collection. I have so often been termed America's worst president, as well as a single hand clapping to an unacknowledged demise of the Democratic Party, that in all honesty, it's not part of my mirror anymore. At one time, I took it to bed with me, the word failure like a grape made sore and too soft, rubbed again and again between soiled fingers. I slept with it, wore its dark stain as a shield each morning, ate it, swallowed, suckered it, burped it, a prized possession till it turned to stone. I didn't throw it away, didn't want to lose its effect on me. Growing up in the South, white or black, taught one to grow a soul first, not second, to make certain its vestments, the eyes, the hands, were always steady. Black children I saw without shoes heading for rundown schools did not wear suffering as a badge I might. Pain was deep in them as tree roots. We whites suffered parasitically, small scars on an almost beautiful face. Screams we on occasion heard were blinding as 12 sons. You had to close your eyes for fear of losing all sight. At times, I lost consciousness and waited for the church's bell to toll. A fury in my heart, buried deep, became raw. It bubbled close to my lips, forcing me to smile too wide and clench my teeth. As I was born, a private joy to my parents in Plains, Georgia's governor swayed and expanded like a syrupy praline, soaked in applause and laughter at the Ku Klux Klan's annual ball. It was a secret. I lay out my sweaters while naked. It may have appeared as though I always wore the same cardigan, blue button down, a thin brown cross stitch. In truth, I had many sweaters, many shades of blue, various mohair, and sailor's cable stitch, no two interchangeable. 
Roz and I chuckled in private about the anchorman's unchecked lust for my quiet lust. A self-contained chuckle with my very best friend. When I looked her in the eye, it was enough, and skirts fell away. Our spirits rose to the arch ceiling without argument. But the sweaters were my secret, and thoughts I had while making a deft selection of style or color. The poet may think of lime or lemon, if citrus be what the sun needs, of shallow peelings, grapes falling to a rotting river's bottom and old woman's teeth, of ocean arc, whip and spray, of all the hard things people must do and the simplest pleasures, slicing cold butter, singing loudly over a parade. I never learned to rush. Growing up in the South, we really didn't have time for it. I hear about the stress it causes. Is it equivalent to the stress of sitting still, looking dully into a day devoid of opportunity? Amiri Baraka once said, why should any man or woman run to be someplace at a certain time when he or she is capable of walking with dignity and grace to arrive at the right time? Do you think suddenly of helicopters over dusky roofs maneuvering with M42s poking out, silver noses, a failure of language or simply drama? Occasionally Shakespeare puts in principle what would never make us laugh in practice. I have studied nobility in weary faces of Native American chiefs. Yet the world over, I note, people who crave peace without appeasement cannot ascend the arc of nobility to attain it. So much stands in the way, food, water, and open sky. I wonder, was darkness not a dream God had of shadowless calm and repose? To breathe and walk in peace among friends, the dead as well as the living. For one does not imagine God sleeping ever. Would that be the end of all things, two sides racing across a bridge to the middle? Joys of the South were as resonant as difficulties, a spare cotton field after harvest, the aching wet barnyard smell, pepper pin pricks, an ochre moon rising overhead, occasional night bird, how I love Keats and Dylan T. I can't say God wanted me to be president. President of what, <laughs> my mother asked. It was I who craved a gentleness without tears, who had ambition, my secret in the dark and in the light before the mirror and the mirror inside. Who I am, angle, stealth, and pride. By our good works, do we make ourselves shiny? We had to move home to Plains, family business, my father's passing. I became a peanut farmer for real then. Roz, officer's wife, small town miserable, steadied herself with bookkeeping, cooking for vagabonds, befriending Negro neighbors, despite burning lawns and makeshift cross. Sometimes, in the unnerving shadows of night, questions of simple reality are ominous. I check off a bad dream. I flip through my misgivings from an imperfect childhood. I stick to my mother's fawning wishes as a fly on flypaper. Because I cannot answer daily family questions, I undertake the larger public life where my actions ring steadfast, sonorous, pour real cement where a curb is needed. American baseball is a leisurely sport. Its strategies are endless and the clock isn't ticking. Its cliches never let me down. One day my lover threw me a curveball, walked out forever. If you can't play ball with the big boys, get out of the park. Marcel Duchamp understood time through chess, that thinking short or long is the game itself, not prediction, not happenstance. Sweat on an opponent's brow, crack of wood on a hard fastball, stealthy advance pawn by pawn. The tease to steal, like courting and later marital sex, a superb game with rules intrinsic to fairness respecting the talents of each player, reminiscent of coming to the table at Camp David, 
or being submerged for days underwater waiting to surface behind an enemy marker. I stared absent-mindedly at my croissant as Anwar talked, and I thought about drifting snow, flake by flake, no pattern of relief. I thought about freedom and belief, recalled Malraux saying, freedom is not an exchange, it is freedom. No one ever wants to get, give in, yet the world is populated by those who do and those who don't. And that's it. Wendy often says, or use, why Jimmy Carter? Because it's, but Jimmy Carter was my favorite, he was the first president I voted for, my favorite president. I think I cried when Ronald Reagan beat him. But um, anyway, and I have one poem um, left. This one's called Thanksgiving, and it's uh, in honor of my parents, and the group really helped me with revision. Lena kind of flipped it on its head, and I think it's better. I fixed it on Thanksgiving, so I named it Thanksgiving. One, 50, yard, 50 feet of yard way back, our paradise, sunflowers and pollywogs, limestone and mulch. I loved getting my hands dirty, the feel of hot rocks on my feet, sandy cemeteries with spirit wisps that I was left to roam free. I owe my parents everything, arc of fern, its cucumber smell, fluttering green lace, see-through as a mayfly wing. I owe them my love of water, droplets, snowflakes, shore rings, fog, the way a river winds out of sight and you follow on with your eyes. Two, my parents crashed into things, two big molecules in the rascal brew. Yes, it was hard to follow, but instructive if you braved it. I cursed them through my 20s as we threw martinis down, a love-hate tussle like a bad pop song, how we all squeezed through the storm's eye into a future not remarkable but peaceable enough as their winter's passing. I could do some hereditary digging, tap tap spade our lineage, muck and tarred chromosomes. What quality does my daughter take across the ice? Three. Floating on my back in the waters, I face the sky. An eagle crosses my vision, a loon calls to another loon. Children at camp across the way scream, splash, giggle. I close my eyes tight, tiger eyes around the sun. We've sold their lake home, their slice of heaven. How does the other half live, I hear dad say. In some public place, where I least expect I will burst into tears and disappear. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Lena, and I'm going to read. Um, from uh, a piece that I wrote after finding an old box of letters <clears throat> in my basement, and it's called uh, Catalog of Letters. I found a box of letters, 27 years old or so. It may be the last box of letters in the world. The first letters in the box were written in April of 1987, when I was just about to turn 15. The last were written 10 years later, in 1997, in July. I had just turned 25. Many things changed in that decade for me and for letters. Many things that existed then are gone. These letters remain. By reading these letters, by sifting through these remains, I reveal the faded contours of these two departed things, the age of letters and the 20-year-old girl I was 27 years ago. I found this box of letters in my basement. They must have gotten wet. They're all mildewed and stuck together. Ink from the letters inside has bled through the envelopes, painting blue number two watercolor secrets all over the outsides. This one is purple and green, purple from the ink and green from the Grolsch Premium Lager 12-pack box, imported, that has been housing these letters these last 27 years or so. I'm not sure how or where they got wet. I'm not sure where they have been all this time. 
I did not write these letters, except for one. Their penmanship is not mine. The pictures they paint of a lost world of a younger me are painted with reflected light. Other people reflecting me. Because unless you are a famous genius, and all your friends are famous geniuses, and you all save all your letters for posterity, basically, unless you are Virginia Woolf, all the letters you have are letters that were written to you. A one-sided conversation from which you piece together what you yourself were saying on the other side. From these letters, you piece together, in part, who you were. Table of contents. There are 218 letters in this box. They date mostly from the 1990s and from the years 1990 to 95 when I was in and out of college, then back in, then back out, then in and out once more. Some are loose from their envelopes, dateless, and so lost in time. The banner years for letters seem to have been 1990 and 1993, with 61 and 57 each, respectively. 58 of the letters are from my mother. That's one in every four. 15 are from my grandfather on my mother's side. His name was Richard. He went by Dick. He signed his letters, Love, Grandpa. There are 65 different senders in all, five letters from the first boy I ever kissed, 14 from my friend Caroline, 16 from aunts and uncles, four from my brother Reuben, and one from someone called Bo. <laughs> <clears throat> one of the return addresses reads, guess who? On another, the sender has whited out their name and scribbled in Dr. Ruth. <clears throat> Some are from people I don't remember at all. Some sign cheekily, love me, and it is only through careful detective work, the return address, the year, the secrets of the letter itself, that I can piece together who they were and how we knew each other well enough to send letters once upon a time. The envelopes are postmarked in places like Denver, Colorado, Brooklyn, New York, Tucson, Arizona, South Bend, Indiana, Eureka, California, Portland, Maine, Alter, Belgium, and Keeler, Australia. They are addressed to me at 10 different addresses in five different states on two different continents. I was a nomad once. The name above the address varies too. Lena Batgirl Weatherby, says one from my mother. Or later on, hi, Lena girl. Inga Weatherby, says another, inexplicably. Dear Sweet Cakes, writes my impish little brother, I finally get some respect around here now that you are gone. On the back of one is written, in big letters, save the dolphins. On another, to postmaster, VIP mail, please deliver by Pony Express or train or airplane or whatever is best. Thank you. These letters are broken shards, relics, real pieces of something gone, real blood, real hair, real bone, real paper, real ink, real envelope. You can hold these letters in your hand. They have weight. But what do they mean? We understand our world, we humans, by classifying it. Genus and species, periodic tables of elements, decimal systems, seasons, denominations, castes. We organize and group, we draw distinguish, we break things down into parts. Letters can be many things, as can girls aged 15 to 25. Here are the section headings for this catalog of letters in me. Loneliness, comfort, dreams, lies, poetry, time, advice, Surprise. Comfort. 26.6% of, of the letters in this box are from my mother. In one prolific stretch in October of 1990, there are five in one week. On Monday, October 22nd of that year, she writes, Dear Lena, hi. I'm going to call you on the phone in a while, but thought I'd write a note anyway <laughs> to fill your mailbox. What follows are the dull details of ordinary life that must have been like a warm blanket to my cold college solitude. Reuben went to play practice, but found he didn't need to go. He says the play is dumb. <laughs> what a flood of rain we had yesterday. Last night, Dad had a concert. I have a little more extra time, but it seems I get less done. At least looking around the piles of books in this family room, it would appear that way. This goes on and on. My mother was filling my mailbox with home. My brother, too, wrote home stories and sent them to me. This is another thing that letters do. They paint scenes with personalities and wallpapers that are familiar. And by sending these scenes to us, they paint us in. Wish you were here, they say, or guess what, or it was the funniest thing. And magically, we were there, and we guessed what, and we were laughing together at the funniest thing. 
Here's the scene for the story my brother sent to me on October 31st, 1990. It is Thanksgiving at my grandmother Weatherby's house. This is my father's mother, the preacher's wife. Everything is very tidy and exact, clock ticking the same way it always does, the same strange homemade pickles every year, the same stack of thin white bread and hard butter, and the same old unbearable conversations, puritanical, doctrinal, religious, and dull, at least to my brother and me. He writes, you really miss something Sunday. We had an early Thanksgiving dinner for the Weatherby side of the family. There was no talk of religion. Aunt Anne had a much more interesting topic to be stubborn about, premarital laundry. Our good aunt was upset because Jenny was doing Peter's laundry for him. Just think what that could lead to. <laughs> it seems that Jenny and Peter are talking of marriage. At the dinner table, Nicholas and I were seated in between the dueling mother and child. Jenny got in some low blows concerning Aunt Anne's eloping. It was difficult to keep from laughing. Uncle Harry was also in a comical mood that spiced up the dinner. You really missed out. But I didn't miss out at all. I was not at college miserable anymore. I was with my brother and my cousin Nicholas at my grandmother's table, caught between my rebel laundress cousin and her mother, the puritanical Aunt Anne. I could hear un rogue Uncle Harry's wild mutterings. I could not stop giggling. This is the comfort that letters from family bring. Warm, crazy remembrance of things you missed. The patterned wallpapers of where we come from. Hi, I'm Sam Smith. I'm going to read from a novel that I'm working on. The novel is uh, at the moment called A Falling Knife. Um, this is the first chapter of the novel, so I shouldn't have to explain anything. Um, <laughs> if you don't understand what's going on, it's my fault. Right. Sarah sat opposite her boss, Louise's empty desert of a desk between them. Louise sat perfectly straight and perfectly composed. Prim, Sarah thought. Perfectly prim. Terrifyingly prim, if that was possible. Louise wore a wine red suit and a creamy satin blouse. The bow at her neck was centered and even. Her makeup was flawless, conservative. Her hair was tightly controlled. Like a newscaster, Sarah thought, or a daytime talk show host. Sarah had on the same suit she'd worn for her first interview for this job. Her only other business attire was her second interview suit, which was sitting in her closet. It was a little tight for all day wear. Louise was setting out her expectations for Sarah when a deep voice behind Sarah's left shoulder made her jump in her seat. Louise, I need to fire someone. Sarah looked back. An enormous man was moving toward the conference table behind her. Louise said, good morning, Derek. Do we need to start the protocol for improving the performance of an employee who is unsatisfactory? Sarah returned her gaze forward, feeling the need to focus on her boss. She heard a chair protest under a heavy load. Waste of time. He needs to go. Louise smiled. And has this unsatisfactory performer committed any of the acts that justify immediate dismissal? Is sheer incompetence and assholery one of them? <laughs> Louise raised her hands, then tapped her left pinky with her right forefinger. Commission of a felony during work hours? I wish. She tapped her third finger, accessing pornography from a work computer. Amazingly, no. Second finger drug or alcohol abuse while on the job. Does food abuse count? <laughs> Louise's right forefinger halted in mid-motion. What? No, there's no such thing. Where, where was I? She tapped her forefingers. Oh, yes. Theft of company property. No. Sarah felt like a tennis net. Comments were being lobbed back and forth over her head. To her relief, Louise stood up. 
Let's join Derek at the conference table. She gestured for Sarah to sit opposite her with the giant man in between. Derek, she continued, this is Sarah. Today is her first day as a member of the Human Resources Department here at HPC. Derek stood up, looming over her, and stuck out his hand. Welcome to HPC. Can you fire people? <laughs> Sarah took his hand briefly. She looked over at Louise. Louise was smooth. As a member of the department, Sarah will be able to carry out all functions, including the three-step process for addressing unsatisfactory performance. However, as today is her first day, I will take the lead here. Derek sat down again. Now, ask Louise, who needs guidance? Dave. Not, yes, that Dave, Dave Pomerantz. The name seemed to ruffle even the serene Louise. I don't know if we can do anything. Derek growled. Louise, he's a cancer. Every morning, he clocks in, then he goes downstairs and buys breakfast, then he brings it back up, and then he eats it while he checks his stocks on his computer. Meanwhile, everyone else is flying around trying to keep up with work. Louise shook her head. Have you talked to him? He doesn't care what I say. He thinks I can't touch him. Spencer says last week, Dave was cutting his toenails in their office <laughs> while he was eating a bagel. Like I said, food abuse. Louise sighed. I can start the process if you like. I think you have reasons for being unsatisfied with his performance. Damn right. Derek slapped his hand down on the small table, and it lurched toward him. He steadied it and brought it back level. Sarah marveled at his fingers. They were the size of sausages. <laughs> you know how it works, Derek, said Louise. Give him a verbal warning, document it, and give it to me for his file. She paused. I'll have to talk to Jerry about this. He's going to have to be involved. I know, said Derek. Fucking Voldemort is going to go apeshit. Louise seemed unfazed. I'll get back to you, Derek. He stood up and lumbered out, moving surprisingly fast. Louise had now gone back behind her desk. Sarah, come back and we'll pick up where we left off. Sarah made her way back. If Louise had lost her serenity for a moment, she had now fully recovered it. Derek is colorful, but he is fundamentally a good person, she said. Is he always that foul-mouthed? Louise smiled. He doesn't mean it in a bad way. Although I don't know what that last thing he said was. Between the F word and the, the ape word, Sarah was even more surprised. Voldemort? You don't know who he is? He's a bad guy in Harry Potter, the baddest of the bad guys. He's so scary that people are afraid to say his name. Louise laughed. That's perfect. I haven't read Harry Potter, but I know what Derek means now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda White. I've been a member of Pen and Pencil for so long that this must be like my 10th or 12th or 15th reading. And I enjoy it each time. Um, tonight I'm going to read a piece that I've dedicated to my mother, my aunt, and my mother's aunt, who are all seamstresses. For those who know me, um, I am obsessed with fashion. And so I have spent a lot of time reading about it and a little bit of time writing about it. So this is sort of a, a mix of a homage to my mom and a little bit about my obsession with fashion. And this piece is called Fabulous. Every issue of Harper's Bazaar tells women to be fabulous at any age. Well, I learned a long time ago about fabulousness, not from Bazaar, but from the family fashionistas, all of whom were seamstresses, 
masters of their wardrobes, sparkling with sartorial splendidness. Let's start with Great Aunt Lucille. She was one of my icons of elegance, a tall woman of style and grace. She worked for decades as a maid for a wealthy family, but she had a secret life as the belle of many DC balls. Auntie was the life of any party she attended. Saturday nights saw her outfitted in creations of satin, velvet, and lace. She was supermodel tall and slim, which made her hard to fit, but a great mannequin for most styles. Aunt Lucille could look at a dress in a shop window and then whip up the identical frock overnight. She preferred clothes that were easy to dance in, making it easy to glide and spin across the polished floors in dance halls throughout Black Broadway, the city's U Street corridor. The reality of segregation forced her attention to self-made glamour. Until the 1960s, black people in the district could not try on clothing in department stores. We could buy, but we had to make, ed we had to make educated guesses on fit. She was not a fan of guesswork. My Aunt Julia was paid to make gorgeous outfits for people. She had a room in her house that was dedicated to her craft. She kept bolts of fabric in the room, and patterns marked with names and measurements were stuffed into makeshift shelves. Prayer cards with pictures of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane were stuffed into the frames of full-length mirrors. Fashion magazines, pattern books, and TV guides were scattered everywhere. A crucifix nailed to the wall was a reminder that you weren't too cute to obey the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Julia stayed up late with the cool glow of black and white TV over her left shoulder, creating masterpieces, miracle dresses that created assets where there weren't any. She sewed while Joey Bishop, Johnny Carson, and the 1960s and 70s stage and screen stars visited the room with their jokes, stories, and songs. My mother learned about making clothes from her Aunt Lucille, and I was one of the happy beneficiaries of her experiments. Mom had a more creative approach to sewing. She liberally added fringe, scallops, and ruffles to everything. She used bold, show-stopping prints, saturated colors that livened up parties and shook up the PTA, polka dots, animal prints. She commandeered our living room and occasionally overflowed into the kitchen with her hobby. Her portable sewing machine sat front and center in the living room on a sturdy card table. Stacks of neatly folded fabrics covered end tables. Baskets on the coffee table overflowed with spools of thread in a color palette that rivaled Pantone. Scissors, seam rippers, tailor's chalk, and pin cushions of every size. Colorful buttons in ceramic ashtrays reminded you of hard candy. She started making simple sheath dresses made less simple with the addition of her trademark ruffles. Her motto was, another day, another chance to turn heads. She quickly branched out to tiger striped corduroy pantsuits and op art inspired jumpsuits. Now I wasn't shy, but she dressed me to fit her personality, which was a little larger than life and reached further than her housewife identity. I wore uniforms to school every day, but she turned me into weekend Barbie. I loved it and always looked forward to her next flash of inspiration. We poured over huge pattern books at department stores and strolled through forests of fabric displays, imagining the possibilities of each print, color, and texture. I imagined myself as one of the leggy models in the pattern books with a wardrobe as large as my mother's imagination. If I didn't have anything to wear to the sophomore dance or birthday party, she'd whip up a fit and flare dress in a delightful mint green dotted Swiss or maybe a fuchsia maxi skirt with a purple lining and coordinating head wrap. Nothing was too bold. I requested outfits for special occasions, usually rock concerts. She delivered dramatic royal blue satin capes reminiscent of Red Riding Hood, black velvet bell bottoms, and dove gray velour coverall coveralls. She sewed matching dresses for us for my high school graduation. 
And contrary to popular thought about teen girls striking out with wildly different looks than their mothers, I was honored to echo her style. After three decades, the sewing machine fell silent as illness took its toll on my mother's concentration and dexterity. No more buzzing and rumbling of the machine motor or the split-second dimming of the lights in our house when she mashed a foot pedal. I would miss the intimacy of fittings and the thrill of seeing freshly finished dresses hanging on the door to my room. I packed up her sewing room when she died. There would be no more gowns for local brides and bridesmaids or dashikis for dad. No more sophisticated Sunday go-to-meeting dresses filling her closets. I never learned to make dresses for myself or anyone else, but I hand-stitched a few sheath dresses with ruffled hems for my Barbies, hand-sewed a floor cushion cover, and became adept at replacing buttons and hemming skirts. Fast fashion has replaced a seamstress. The trendy, the now, and the same have edged out individual imagination and the joys of creating with one's own hands. And for me, sustainable fashion is one that sustains memories and traditions. H&M is selling leopard print dresses, but I hesitate because it wasn't made by my seamstress. The woman who pressed and curled my hair for Easter walked me and my best friend to school, and tucked me into bed at night. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Shea. I write a, a wide variety of things. I'm reading th three short pieces today. Um, yeah, there's most about two pages long or something like that. Uh, I have to alert you, though, that the very first piece is for mature audiences. The sexual organ. I happened to be in a Sam Ash megastore one recent day, browsing among the guitars. I caressed a white Fender Telecaster. I tested the action of a Gibson Les Paul. I formed a power cord on a BC Rich War Beast. Sighing with what might have been Ness, I then sauntered over to the store's keyboard section. There I saw an attractive model labeled the Roland XXX Atelier Combo Organ. Although I have no talent for piano or organ, I occasionally like to play a rudimentary three-fingered version of Neil Young's When the Morning Comes <laughs> on whatever keyboard instrument is at hand. So I turned on the Roland and pressed down a key to test the volume. Ooh, that feels good. Startled, I looked around. Who had spoken so seductively? The voice was a little odd, probably a woman's, but more metallic, more processed than I would have expected. No one was near. Everyone else I could see seemed engrossed in examining other instruments. I shrugged and pressed another key. Yes, that's how I like it. <laughs> this time I sprang back from the organ as if it had metamorphosed into a man-eating tiger. I, sh oh, excuse me, I shrugged, oh, excuse me. Um, so, oh, what the hell was going on? <laughs> Could this voice be coming from... No, it made no sense. Had there been something not quite right about the yogurt I slurped down at lunch? <laughs> With a nervous finger, I pressed another key. Ooh, baby. <laughs> Rock me like my back ain't got no bone. <laughs> Grimly, I formed a chord. At first... I thought the show was over, but then came a strangled gasp and a whimper. <laughs> Do that to me one more time. Make me tingle all over. Can I help you? Came a voice just behind me. I jumped, then turned in some embarrassment. It was one of the Sam Ash salespersons. Actually, I began, I don't really know. This um, organ seems a little unusual. 
Well, it's the newest model, he replied, raising a brow. We've heard nothing but good things about it from our satisfied customers. But it doesn't seem to play music. True, quite true, but it's not intended to play music now, is it? Ah, I can show you something more traditional, if you'd like, in the same price range right over there. He nodded to his left. But if you're looking to spice up a party, this is your model. Thanks, I'll think about it. With a nod, he walked away. I stared at the Roland XXX Atelier Combo Morgan, organ, excuse me, for a few moments more. Was it my imagination, or was there a lascivious gleam to all those white keys? Were the black keys yearning for a light touch, a stroke, a firm, no. I wrenched myself away and hurried back to the guitars, where it was safer, or at least seemed to be. Uh, this one is called Plot. I know you like plot-driven stories. I know you want stories that are driven by plot. So that is what I'm going to give you. Let's let style sleep in today with the shutters closed tight and we'll pack this baby into a sleek vehicle driven by plot and hit the gas. It will be an exciting ride, let me tell you. No delays while metaphors are sharpened. No pointless meandering in the thick groves of personality. No, not for you, not for us, not for this one. So we've got Jeff, and he's in as much of a hurry as we are. What do you have to know besides the fact that somebody done him wrong, and Jeff has himself a bit of firepower that those bastards didn't reckon on? I won't tell you that Jeff had an abusive father and had been pathologically shy around nice girls. No way. Why would you care? You'll see Jeff move like lightning from point A to point B, say a cheap diner where some shady characters often hang out, to point C and D, and maybe all the way to point Z, unless, that is, Jeff gets around to knocking some sense into one of the less important crooks and finds out where the hell the headquarters is. But buckle your seatbelts. He's getting close to 75 on a 35 MPH road through some nondescript neighborhood. And sure, there are some lights going on and some yelling, but nothing like that is going to stop Jeff and this story. No, sir, not with all its writing on his getting to the damn place in time. You can flesh out the details, a walled mansion, perhaps even with barbed wire on the top of the walls, but who cares as long as our hero can use his electronic skills to jiggle with the gate? Yes, there it is, swinging open, with barely a pause between. Back into the car. Something about multinational corporations, money laundering in Switzerland, some poor schmuck double-crossed and damn pissed about it, Tall or short, blonde or dark, who the hell cares? Maybe a bit of an accent. But Jeff tracks him down and gets the information he needs. What's the term Hitchcock came up with? The MacGuffin or McMuffin or Mac the Knife? Doesn't matter. There are guns firing, cars screeching, computer screens flashing as $700 billion is transferred from a secret government fund to the Swiss account of a blackmailer. You don't need to know any more about why Jeff does what he does or what he thinks about it. It's a hell of a lot of money, duh. And I won't tell you about how his wife at home is feeling lonely and tossing her brown or blonde or red hair while thinking about taking a class in art appreciation where... Thank you. That's, <laughs> that one's done. <clears throat> Um, I, was, I was fortunate two years ago to have a book published of, of my tales from Webster's, which are made from using as the sort of spine of the tale consecutive words in this old dictionary from 1970. Um, and I've been continuing to write them, and that's what I'm going to finish with. Uh, to give you an idea of what the, the words on that side look like, you, you can't read them here. Um, but at any rate, this one is called Incognito to incommu Incommutable, 
And there are, these are the first that begin incognito, incognizant, incoherence, incoherent. And the last three are these incommunicado, incommunicative, incommutable. So this is, as I say, incognito to incommutable. I can't believe I waited this long again. When will I learn? When will I ever learn? But if I don't do it, what would happen? Will they really come after me? Could I go incognito, maybe move to a different apartment and sort of fake a foreign accent? We hear those guys are fierce. You can't just lie low and pretend nothing's going on or claim you were incognizant or temporarily insane. They're hard, they're maybe even cruel. Can I vanish or is it too late? God knows there's already too much incoherence in my life. I don't need this. Too late to update my passport, probably? And where the hell is it? In the footlocker? In the drawer with my socks? Hell, I'm practically incoherent. Take a deep breath, son, deep breath, but not too long. Should I burn the papers, all of them? Shit, they're probably incombustible. Besides, the numbers are probably available by other means. Can't us to underestimate what they can do. Why do I wait so long? Every goddamn year. I'm just not a numbers guy. I do have an income, that I can't deny. Every year, son, every year, but pretty pitiful compared to the fat cats. That's for sure. And I probably have an income statement somewhere in this mess as well, as a working American. But it always seems so difficult, so involved, so technical, so maddening to prepare my income tax return. Maybe I can find a doctor who diagnose tax phobia or extreme tax delusionary syndrome or something like that. And then if so, I'd list his fee among health expenses for the incoming year, right? <coughs> or maybe the feds would give me a year off to recover from my EXTDS. Yeah, I like it. Or should it be acute tax delusionary syndrome? The caps should help. The effects are incommensurable on the patient, the doc could say. It leaves the poor patient just a shell of himself. Yes, ATDS. So no jail, that's only fair. Any jail time would be, what would a sharp lawyer say, incommensurate with the plaintiff's actions, or in this case, lack of action. And in his state, it would be dangerous to incommode him in any overt way. Jail time would most certainly be incommodious. And it is my expert opinion that my client, I mean my patient, almost certainly suffers from, what's it called? Oh, right, social anxiety. The severe incommodity of being in a tiny cell or mingling with total strangers, many of whom might have murdered dozens of people, I need a scary sounding illness so complicated that it's really incommunicable. Maybe starting with DYS. Yes, that might work. But what if I'm stuck in a cell off by myself? with nobody to talk to or to sing jail songs with. <laughs> that would be just as awful being held incommunicado for who knows how long, and there would probably be long-term repercussions. I might become taciturn, say, incommunicative, unable to even ask for water when the cell is 120 degrees. I just hope acute tax delusionary syndrome works and keeps me out of jail. God, let's hope so. And what if a sentence of tax evasion is incommutable? Deep breath, deep breath. Okay, I'll take some Prozac. And then let's take another look at it. Yes, be strong, be strong. Turbo tax. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Matt. Um, I've been working on a fantasy novel, but tonight I'm going to read something a little more personal. <clears throat> the first time my father was diagnosed with cancer was a day before a family vacation. I wasn't going. I lived apart from them at this time, but they had planned to go to the south and see my maternal uncle, my maternal grandfather, and enjoy the nature of northwestern Georgia. I thought it would be good to be with family, but they told me they wouldn't tell anyone else until they got back. 
They said this was to avoid ruining the vacation. They said that the family would become distressed and it would give a mournful feel to the whole trip, something they were determined to avoid. I've wondered what that vacation must have been like, my parents and my brother pretending to enjoy the beauty of Georgia. In truth, it's not that hard for me to imagine. I was there for every other moment they pretended to enjoy. When they told me they wouldn't tell anyone that he had cancer on the vacation, they also told me I couldn't tell anyone, that it was best to keep this in the family. This was a familiar refrain. Keeping it in the family explained why the Kennedys, with their constant public grieving, were bad. Why I was at fault when I told my grandmother that my father had said the F word, full of anger because my infant brother was crying. Why the holes in the wall from my father's fist was really not a big deal, and that he would teach me how to do it, as long as I didn't do it too much. With his cancer, to keep it in the family meant I couldn't tell my extended family until my mother had. I imagine it must have been strange to hear from family that just visited that someone had a tumor growing inside of him that whole time, that it too had been on vacation. According to my father, on that vacation, he stared down off my uncle's deck and imagined flinging himself over past the leafy foliage to splatter on the stones below. He told me, that this was a side effect of the medicine. I'm sure it was. It's also a side effect of feeling trapped and that you can't talk to anyone about how you are feeling. If I said this to my father, he'd tell me, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> With all the angsty aggression of a teenager saying, duh. So all of these moments fly through my mind within minutes of receiving my brother's text telling me that our father has cancer again. Well, Actually, the text said, hey man, mom wanted me to text you slash call you. I know you're busy, so I figured texting would be best. If you want to call me, that's obviously totally fine. I imagine you probably already know what it's about. It's as if it's some sort of code, but instead of Morse, it's dysfunctional Irish Catholicism. <laughs> because I live away from the rest of them, it took me a moment to decode the message. My mother had told me the other day that my father was going to the doctor and that they had found something on his lungs. She emphasized how much this was nothing to worry about. I always forget that she suppresses everything, perhaps because the recollection of when she no longer could is so distinct, or the threat that she may no longer be able to hold it all in. Like the time she told me she couldn't watch Schindler's List with me because if she started to cry, she would never stop. My grandmother died a year ago, and my mother walked around the funeral home with a box of tissues, her eyes perpetually leaking. Then I went home three weeks later for Thanksgiving, and she asked me what was wrong with my aunt that she was crying so much. At Christmas, she told me another aunt needed a grief therapist. At Christmas, I was told that my mother pushes all her feelings down, which is probably not good. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> My father, on the other hand, has a balanced view of grief. After my four and a half year relationship that I assumed would lead to marriage ended, he texted me daily updates of the weather where they live. <laughs> Two months later, he asked how I was doing, and after I answered him truthfully, he told me, let's not get all maudlin. I don't know if it's better or worse that he seemed to be choking back tears as he said it. Five months after the breakup, he asked me if he, I was seeing anyone new. When I said no, he told me I should probably start. When I told him never to say something like that to me again, he told me it wasn't paternal advice, he was just saying. When I explained that in fact any advice he gave to me was, by <laughs> definition, paternal advice, he told me it was just a bad joke. <clears throat> the fact that this argument happened on his birthday probably makes it worse on my part. <clears throat> Obviously, I am angry at my father and my mother. I am angry at them for different yet similar reasons. I am angry at both of them for lying to me and telling me that life was going to be great when their own sorrow, angst, and tortured inner life made them know better. I am angry because they are both going to die. I am angry at him because he is going to die first, and I am angry at her because I'm going to have to take care of her after he does. 
I'm going to have to sell their home after I pay someone to find the leak that has evaded them for a decade. <laughs> I'm going to have to sell his tools, which he could never bear to part with. I'm going to have to once again be the responsible one. <clears throat> Throughout my childhood, I heard about how caring I was as a child. My mother was sad, and as a two-year-old, I told her that it was okay because sometimes you bump your head. A few years later, after her miscarriage, I reassured her that it was fine. God just needed to make sure the baby was okay. I was always told I was a good boy because of this. It took me many years to realize that not every child is such a comfort to their parents, that there may be something sad about my apparent need to reassure her. No shit, Sherlock. I'm angry at her because based on her record collection, she used to be cool. <clears throat> Bruce Springsteen, Janis Joplin, Black fucking Sabbath? Who was this woman? I'm angry at him because he clearly never was Smothers Brothers. No shit, Sherlock. When reading about grief, it's always easy to see the anger as some stage the grieving have to pass through. That past anger, there will be acceptance. The grieving may be feeling this way now, but they won't always. If that is true, I'm not grieving his diagnosis of cancer. I'm grieving a life. I cannot decide if it is his or what mine was supposed to be. It is a strange thing that children can so sense their parents' own hurts, the way their parents were not parented the way they needed to be. Perhaps those of us who feel we have to parent our parents try to do better, but that order never quite works. A 12-year-old can never convince his mother that if she starts to cry, one day she will stop. Perhaps worse than knowing how they have been hurt is seeing how unavoidable it is that their hurt will not end with them that the hurt of a grandparent will be yours too. That my grandmother could never get her children to be Irish enough that they liked Danny Boy. <laughs> but the shadow of alcoholism loomed over all of them. They all know when her father was too drunk to drive home and recruited his 10-year-old daughter to figure it out. They also know when that child grew up and enabled her own son's drinking. Just as I know, the day my father saw my uncle stamp down on newly born bunnies, remarking, the mother will never come back now that we've found them. And while I did not see their bodies thrash and then go limp, I know what it is like to feel that someone views the world as a cruel place. I'm unsure if these are realities we all must confront. Perhaps I am too critical and their intentions are loving and good. Parents are just imperfect, like everything and everyone. The world is hard and difficult and yes, beautiful and meaningful. Should I value these lessons as I value how he taught me how to tie my shoes? Or is it the way tragedy begets tragedy in this world? The way the road twists from my grandfather's question of, why did you get a C in this class? To my father's, if my father saw this report card, he'd only focus on the C, but everything else looks great. One Thanksgiving, I was playing football. I did something, something I don't remember, that was mischievous and probably bratty. I probably don't remember it because I did many things that fit into this category at that age. I did it to my uncle and he started to push me. I was laughing and my uncle was too, although I also think he was probably angry. He pushed me across the lawn and into a bush. I fell in laughing, but a branch scratched at my arm and I yelped. My uncle asked me if I was okay, and I said I was. I'm sure a part of my response was to save face. My father drove us home that night. My mother was seated beside him and my younger brother beside me in his car seat. We pulled out of my grandparents' driveway and quickly the engine roared and my small body bounced in the back seat. My mother tried to reason with him by telling him that she understood he was angry but could he please slow down? She only managed to say the understand part before he yelled, damn right I'm pissed, he pushed my son. And the engine roared ever louder as we took another sharp turn. He felt protective of me, but more I think he felt scared on my behalf. I don't think he ever thought that us barreling down a windy side road at 60 miles per hour felt far scarier than being shoved into a bush 
or that the message I needed to hear when I left for college was that everything would be okay, that I would make friends. Instead, he warned me that I was too trusting and he knew that I would be hurt by that. So, the cancer grows. After I spoke to him, my mother, who was traveling, asked me if he sounded okay. I didn't know how to answer, so I evaded the question. But she was persistent. Finally, I told her he sounded angry and scared, but that is how he usually sounds to me. So, I guess he's okay. But he is scared, and I think he should be. I didn't tell her that I am too. After all, I wouldn't want to ruin her vacation. His fear begets mine, and what my fear will beget remains unclear. I, probably like him and his father before him, hope to repair the hurts that I have experienced, but they are a powerful current that pulls us towards them in an endless drama spanning generations. No shit, Sherlock. Thank you all. Thank you so much, everybody. That was just a wonderful, compelling way to end our reading. I feel really, really beautiful, Matt. And now please join us for um, libations and treats, chocolate cakes Susan brought, and then the Kelly Writers House put out a bunch of food for us. So, and some wine, there's wine and other beverages. Everybody's gonna stay, right? Because. Like John says, we like to sing with our friends when we're in jail or at the reading.